So at the studio with Kitchen Theory, we have Dr. Lawrence Haddad. Lawrence is an economist and executive director of GAIN, whose main interests are the intersection between poverty, food security, and malnutrition. Last year, Lawrence and David Navarro, a uh, former special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General, were awarded the 2018 World Food Prize, an international award emphasizing the importance of a nutritious and sustainable global food supply. Today, we're going to be discussing food waste, food security, nutrition, and sustainability. Lawrence, it's a real genuine pleasure to have you back at the studio again. I believe it was about a year, was it a year ago that you came for dinner? Yeah, about a year and a half ago. And yeah, it was we a wonderful were, experience. Yeah. Thank you. It's great we, to be here. Uh, we've been introduced through Paul Noonan, um, mm-hmm. who's the director of the um, SDG2 Advocacy Hub and has been working on the Chef's Manifesto and had joined us um, on the show. And when he first introduced us, I was quite frankly fascinated by your dedication over many, many years towards um, global improvement and specifically in the area of um, food. Now, I mentioned GAIN, which is the... Uh, Global Alliance for uh, Improved Nutrition. It would be great if you could start by giving us a bit of an idea about the organization, your aims and objectives. Thanks so much for, for having me here and it's, gr- it's great to be here. So GAIN is a, a nonprofit NGO. It's about uh, 250 people and has offices in 15 different countries. And we are really trying to bring the government and the private sector together to solve problems in the food system. So our food systems, whether it's the global or the national, the subnational level, they're not generating enough food that are nutritious, that are affordable, that are desirable, um, and that are safe for people to avoid and prevent malnutrition. So malnutrition affects one in three people worldwide. And when we talk about malnutrition, mm-hmm. what are we? What exactly does that mean? Because I think that's for some people a bit of an ambiguous term, right? Sure. No, it is. It's we we do a really terrible job of defining malnutrition. It's it's basically um, the interaction of a poor quality diet with a poor health environment. Okay. So it could be anything from anemia to overweight to obesity to stunting and wasting. Stunting and wasting are kids that are too short for their height or really thin. You know, you see them right. on UNICEF, Save the Children kind of ads. At the core of all of those forms of malnutrition is poor diet. Um, people just can't afford to buy nutritious food. So GAIN mm-hmm. brings the governments and the private sector together to try to solve those. And it's we're quite an unusual organization because many yeah. in the nutrition field are very allergic to the private sector. They say the private sector is a big part of the problem. They're they're generating all this junk food that is um, poisoning us, that's bankrupting our health systems because of the, the, the poor nutrition quality, the high sugar, the high salt, the high fat, uh, the empty calories. And we, we say, yes, that is a, a big part of the problem, but mm-hmm. the food system has to change and businesses are the food system. So you can't ignore businesses. You have to somehow engage them and incentivize them. We also try and break it down. What, is, what, a business, what does business mean? It's not just big food industries. It's non-food companies as well. So the mobile phone companies, the refrigeration mm-hmm. companies, the haulage companies, you know, the marketing agencies. But it's also small and medium enterprises. Most people on low incomes in Africa and South Asia, which is predominantly where we work, mm-hmm. they get their food from small and medium enterprises, small retailers, small producers, small processors. So that's what makes us unusual. We work at the policy level, but also at the programmatic level. We, we deliver programs so we will support small and medium enterprises who want to produce more fresh fruit and uh, fresh vegetables we'll say to them you're you're selling 10,000 units a week now we'll help you get to 100,000 200,000 300,000 so you can expand your your profits Mm -hmm. in a in a food that is nutritious and but then also lower the price to the consumer and that that's that's the kind of thing we do so What's interesting here is because when you talk, and it's true, when you talk about kind of big food uh, companies, people tend to have a bit of an, uh, well, there's a general negative uh, perception around, let's say, their objectives. Now, I think one thing that we kind of, I've always felt when having this discussion is we forget to realize that these companies started out 
by actually supplying huge amounts of food at a much more affordable uh, price point to people. And as much as maybe the, the type of foods aren't right, they do have the infrastructure and scale to supply huge amounts of food to vast numbers of people across the world. And I don't know if, from at least my perspective, I believe that they're necessarily, let's say, evil or have uh, bad intention. They, they are driven, obviously, by certain um, objectives that are monetary and uh, financial in nature. But I also think we're starting to see an awareness in the fact that they want to shift away from that. And we're seeing a lot of the kind of larger food players now try and um, move towards producing foods that are more nutritious, more sustainable. But that is obviously very difficult for these such Mm -hmm. large companies to just shift in, you know, their operations. And so what kind of actions do they have to take or are they taking? Well, you're you're quite right. I mean, these companies, their business models set up a hundred years ago yeah. when the world was very different, um, and so they're really they're really screeching on their brakes and the rails to try to change their business models to meet the times. They tell me the business companies, the big companies, they say we do what the consumer wants, yeah. and we do and we work within the law. That's true up to a point. They do they do work within the law. Um, and they do what consumers want, but of course they can insu- they can influence consumers hugely. Sure. These big companies. You'll find um, lots of companies that say that. Then you find some companies that are saying, "Well, that's not good enough. We have to do more than that." And they do it partly because they they want to be seen to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. And more and more employers uh, are looking for em- uh, more and more employees. Excuse me, are looking to work for companies that have a social purpose yeah certainly in europe and north america Mm -hmm. i think but i think it's going to be a trend worldwide so they're thinking okay i need to i need to recruit the best people i need to be more socially driven socially purposeful many of their investors the big investors are Mm -hmm. saying you know you guys need to step up we're not going to invest in you unless you do x y and z unless you're more ethical you're more purposeful you're more sustainable you're more nutritious and some of the other companies are thinking to themselves, look, this nutrition, this healthy diet, this, di- this drive that we're seeing for healthier foods, it's not going to go away. So we can either be the laggards and kind of sort of be pulled kicking and screaming into this space, or we can mm-hmm. be the pioneers and get the halo effects from being yeah. at the front. So what do they have to do? They have to, um, they have, to have a 10-year plan basically, which says we're going, to, we're going to increase the percentage of our product lines mm-hmm. that meet healthy standards. And there are healthy standards out there. There's something called the um, Health Star Rating, which comes out of Australia. And you can apply that to all kinds of foods. Five is the top star, zero is, is the mm-hmm. bottom star. Many of the products these big food companies produce um, don't make 3.5 stars. In fact, there was a study that showed, uh, I think, about a third of their products, only a third, of, and they sampled thousands of products of the big 20 companies. Only a third of them met a 3.5 out of 5 wow. threshold. So, and, and there's variation there. Some companies do much better than others. Sure. Um, so there's a very tangible goal for them. How do I get my products to be uh, 50% of my, my portfolio to be 3.5 or yeah. 66%? That means reformulation less salt, less sugar. But it also means something more profound than that. It means moving into foods that are less processed, more whole grains, more fresh. Um, and that's that's a big challenge because many consumers don't want that. They want, um, it's too inconvenient. It's, it's, well, it's that's not what tasty I enough. Is there is demand, but is that demand global in a sense of in countries that are affected by a, a malnutrition on a basis of a lack of um, the right kinds of food, are they necessarily demanding, you know, um, what more, uh, let's say, developed countries would call healthier foods? Is that demand necessarily there? Is the education in place that people actually understand what it is that they should be eating? That there are two 
big barriers uh, in the countries we work in, in in Africa and Asia. One is affordability. I mean, there's again, mm-hmm. there's a study that says fifty percent of a household's income, typically, uh, in South Asia and in some countries in Africa, fifty percent of the income of the household will have to be spent on purchasing five fruits and vegetables a day per wow. person. Right. So that's just a non-starter. It should be less than five percent, not fifty percent. Yeah. So we're talking about a tenfold decrease but you're right there is a there is a demand side aspect to this as well in terms of preferences mm-hmm. and what we're seeing now is um, junk food is, is is permeating unhealthy snacks let's put it that way mm-hmm. are, are permeating even the most remote areas of places like Indonesia and really? Bangladesh yeah it's an aspirational thing the advertising the it's the taste it's the convenience yeah. we do work in rural Indo- Indonesia that that gets these snacks you can buy in little kiosks and we dissolve them in water and we show, I mean, it's really revolting. You see them dissolving in water. You see the, the oil slick that forms yeah. in the water and the smell that comes off the cup of water with the stuff in it. So we try to do um, sort of awareness raising about what's mm-hmm. in this food that's bad for your kids. So there is an income st- uh, side to it. It's hard to buy healthy whole grains of fresh fruits, vegetables, eggs, da- some dairy, mm-hmm. some fish. It's expensive. But the other stuff is really quite cheap. And so there is a there is a big education uh, effect. I don't like to call it education because uh, we like to call it uh, emotional demonstration. Uh, okay. em- emodemos, we call them. We do a lot of these. And it's about eliciting an emotional response to the food, whether it's through humor or, or disgust or, um, you know, through... Any, any kind of emotion uh, that makes makes a food um, a negative, a memorable negative and a positive memorable as well. That's fascinating. How did that kind of idea come along? Of Because that's a much better way of engaging people, right? Through yeah. getting them to make the decisions. Because logic is one thing, but then when it comes to what you're actually going to go away and eat, what you're going to spend your money on and what you have the money mm-hmm. to spend on, but when you tap into people's emotional relationship with food, well, that can be much more powerful. But how did that kind of model come about? Well, I think it came about because we work a lot with businesses. Okay. Uh, and businesses are public. The public sector is absolutely hopeless at getting people to eat healthier food. Their, their message is very left brain. It's very logical, linear, yeah. science-based. Eat more fresh food and, and good food because it's good for you. Well, that's, you know, people don't, it's not the, the number one priority for many people, actually. Um, I've got a couple of teenagers, you know, they don't, that message falls very on, on deaf ears for yeah, them. Sure. So the, so what the private sector does brilliantly is figure out what people care about and then link the food to that. They tap in to emotions, to aspirations, um, to to all the, the artistic side, if you like, of, of the brain and, and less mm-hmm. so on the left side. So we try to work, we try to bring marketing agencies from the private sector together with governments so the government say the science is right, the messaging has to has to has to be faithful to the science. Yeah. But the way in which you get the message, where you get the message to be sticky and engaging and memorable, and to penetrate the psyche, is to use the kind of techniques that the private sector knows all too well, and very often uses to sell bad foods. Well, this is interesting because. A lot of the research that we um, conduct at Kitchen Theory in collaboration with Professor Charles Spence, who's the experimental... Yes, I see gastrophysics behind Yeah, you see. Yes, yes. <laughs> Got a whole load of them yes. filling up the shelves. Um, but a lot of the work that we do with um, looking at people's sensory relationship with food and the psychology behind it, what's interesting is a lot of people will say, oh, I'm sure food companies are interested in this stuff. And you think, well... They've been doing this intuitively for quite a while now. We're just starting to kind of reverse engineer this and understand what the processes are that are leading to such successful campaigns mm-hmm. and foods being um, engineered in a way to appeal to such large mm-hmm. kind of global audiences. And there, I think there are so many lessons that can be learned from things that have been done by the private sector, but we they haven't been appropriated in the right way by those who are trying to carry more positive uh, kind of messages. And that's why I think the emotional demonstrations is a wonderful uh, tool. 
The Imodium is fantastic. They've actually been picked up by the government of Indonesia. Now they're being rolled out across the whole of Java, which is, you know, tens wow. and tens of millions of people. So we're very happy about that. And so what would a session look like? Just as Well, I was, a, I was at a session in April and uh, there's a social mobilizer. There's a, about 20 or 30, maybe 50 sometimes mothers with their kids. Mm -hmm. And there um, depends. There's, there's lots of quizzes. Okay. There's lots of games. There's lots of chanting. There's lots of um, uh, kind of amateur dramatics. Okay. Um, there's lots of uh, demonstrations of what's in food. Um, that one that's very vivid for me is the you know let's dilute let's dilute the um, the junk food in the yeah. water and let's let's look at it and smell it. It's really disgusting actually. But I think it's brilliant. And what was their reactions to Discussed. it? Was it really... Recoiling. And, oh my God, are we right. putting this stuff into our kids? But then when you ask them about why they do it, they say it's cheap, it's tasty, the kids yeah. like it, it keeps them quiet. You know, the same things that you would see in, in London, probably. Well, I was going to say, do you know what? We talk about this as being something like we're talking about it as if it's a purely developing third world kind of issue. But I remember on the radio it must have been about a year ago, hearing a quite popular brand, they had a commercial on and it was essentially two parents and they had uh, the children playing in the garden and then the children were banging on the window. Uh, they wanted something to eat and the parents were kind of scrambling, trying to figure out what they do. And they ended up giving them this kind of quite heavily sugar laden snack. Um, and the idea was tied them over till dinner time. And I thought there were two really interesting things mm -hmm. about that. First of all, that the idea of a child, your child being hungry, seemed like some kind of a pain. And it seemed like a distressful situation that you needed to solve using sugar. And second of all, that in London, you know, 2018, 2019, that we, with all the education and awareness that's built around this, that parents are still finding it very difficult to navigate this market. So I don't... I think we have problems all across the board in that sense. Yeah, it's really, I mean, it is really difficult to shift diets in any context, in any geography, for any income group. It's really hard. Um, I'm fascinated by the gastrophysics book. It's yeah. I, I read it after I came here the first time. Oh, right, wow. And um, I'm an economist, right? So economists sure. tend to think income and prices, that's kind of about it, maybe physical mm -hmm. proximity. That, those are the things that drive you. Economists tend to say, let's keep, let's assume preference is a constant. That's mm. that's an assumption they make. Yeah. Um, and of course, ec economics is opening up in terms of behavioral economics, the nudges that mm -hmm. we're beginning to understand that people are not rational in in a in a in a way they choose things. Their emotions play a big role. Yeah. And so I was I loved gastrophysics and 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 many many other books of its type because. Mm -hmm. They do give you all these, all these um, sensory, uh, different sensory, and the inter intersection of senses, and how they affect what we eat and the pleasure we get from the food. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, but I, I, but three years ago, I was giving. I just joined Gain, and I was on the stage of an international conference on nutrition, and I was being asked to talk about, you know, how the the environment around people affects what they eat and what they don't eat, mm -hmm. and I brought this stuff up. And the nutrition community is a very technical, science-based uh, sort of set of people. Sure. And they thought this was kind of crazy stuff. <laughs> and then I, then I said, well, you know, chefs have a big role to play in this because in many ways, uh, chefs, more and more people are eating outside the home. Uh, more, and more, more and more people look to chefs, I think, for, to, to, to give them ideas about how to cook and yeah. how to do it tastily, conveniently, and, and healthily and sustainably. And I said, you know, the chefs are going to become more and more important in the way we, um, way people interact with food, uh, and the the kinds of foods that they they choose to purchase or mm -hmm. eat. And um, I almost got laughed off the stage <laughs> at this international nutrition meeting. I think if I did that now, it wouldn't happen. I think I think the the so world quite... the world that I operate in is, is is opening up. Well, that's interesting because in in um, the world of academia um, and, and kind of hard science, the idea of gastrophysics and kind of um, everything that bleeds into emotional engagement and all that is very messy 
kind of territory. And I think that's why you've up till now only had a small number of people that have been kind of looking into uh, this. But what I found most interesting is that over the last few years, the number of people who I've spoken to in the field of medicine specifically, who are now starting to come around at understanding that food is actually a really important part of healthcare and mm -hmm. prevention specifically. And that was something that I would say five to 10 years ago, anything to do with food and medicine, it was just mm -hmm. not regarded at all. And there was so, no room for discussion. So just boring stats, let me give you some. If you look at every country on this planet, I would say out of the top 10 risk factors that are driving mortality and mor or morbidity, premature mortality and morbidity in that country, uh, five of them are related to what we eat. Wow. So it's, you know, overweight, obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high added sugar consumption, you know, you name it. It's five of the top uh, 10. Some countries at six. So that's, that's a really interesting fact. And I've been trying to communicate to my colleagues in the health system yeah. that, you know, what happens in the food system is essentially bankrupting the health system. It's, it's making it, you know, the number of people are losing limbs from diabetes type 2 in the UK is astonishing. Really? It's absolutely astonishing. And, and this, is all, this is eating up resources in the health sector. Then I heard uh, another colleague of mine was doing some, some work and said, do you know how many days a doctor in the U.S., studies nutrition yeah. do you know this this, this I, factoid I, 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 it's about it's five days it's yeah. a week yeah, yeah, yeah out of how many years and and and, it, and in reality they only study four hours out of the they should do five days but it's extraordinary isn't it it these is these worlds yeah. are so separate when they're so interlinked i i agree and i think as i said it's been interesting to see um even through work that we've done with imperial colleges um cancer research uk uh, lab that they have there just the openness now to having discussions around this. But at the same time, it's interesting to see that a lot of people who are working as researchers in that field don't exactly know how to go about um, both finding the funding for this kind of research and implementing it because as i said it seems to be very messy and then it comes down to um, actually one of the kind of topics that we've got here which is this idea of precision nutrition and this idea that we will all metabolize food in very individual ways uh, one of the largest uh, studies at the moment is going on between uh, king's college massachusetts general hospital and uh, zoe which is a nutritional science company run by tim Spector, i believe and it's interesting in a way uh, that we're kind of opening up these discussions, but at the same time, there still is that resistance towards looking at the role that food plays within healthcare. I don't think people know exactly where to slot that in or where that fits in. Mm -hmm. But if we talk about prevention, I think a lot of it comes down to diet. And if we look at... Um, even well-being, even if we're talking about people who are diagnosed with certain illnesses and diseases, that food plays a vital role in that. But we, we don't, we, it seems from all the discussions I've had, people intuitively get it, but no one knows what this actually means in practice. I think there are three big problems um, related to what, you, what you've just, the area you've, you've highlighted. First of all, it's, it sounds amazing, but we don't actually know very well what people eat yeah we don't have very good measures of what people eat it's a lot of it is self-reported self-recall um it's not observational mm -hmm. observational is very expensive observational can also change behavior if people know they're being watched sure. it's very difficult that's the first thing second thing we don't know a lot about what is in our foods we actually don't we I, I saw a, a stat the other day that said we know about 10 percent of the of the components in vegetables and a lot of the vegetables we we consume there is lots of other things in them we don't really know much about them we don't know what the health consequences of them are so i'm all for more science and more understanding of what is in particular foods mm -hmm. 
the danger to all of this is we confuse consumers. Yeah. Um, so in every newspaper and every day, you know, we pretty much see meat is good for you, meat is bad for you, coffee is good for you, coffee is bad for you, chocolate is good for you, mm-hmm. you know, wine isn't. Yeah. Um, so it, and it's, it really undermines the faith the public has in any of the information we pass on to them, especially, especially in Europe and North America, but elsewhere as well. So we do need some kind of mechanism that brings all the scientists together and, and they, they can hash out what the consensus is and what the kind of messages are. So in the climate world, there's something called the IPCC. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what it stands for now, but it's an intergovernmental panel on climate change. That's what it stands for. And it's scientists around the world. So it's a global picture. It's not mm-hmm. just the US or Europe. Um, do do research and they, they synthesize their research and they come up with a unified set of messages to policymakers around the world and in different countries. And I think that's been a very powerful force for change. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have anything like that in nutrition. So we need more research on what we eat. We need more research on what's in what we eat. But then we need better ways of aggregating and collating all of that to give a unified, simplified message. Very often, the messages we find resonate the best in the countries we work in is just eat just eat lots of different vegetables with different colors. Mm-hmm. That's, mm. you know, that's a simple shortcut way. It's not terribly precise, but it helps people understand. And it's maybe something more tangible that people can relate to and that they can integrate into everyday life without having mm-hmm. to have too much more of a kind of further understanding. Mm-hmm. And it's quite easy to mm-hmm. implement. And it, it's, also, it's also tempting to think about individual foods, but you really want to talk about diets, right? Because sure. individual foods could be not problematic in and of themselves but if you combine them in the wrong way you get diets that are very unhealthy and you mentioned something really interesting there about the components of what are in foods Mm -hmm. and so we're actually working with a computational scientist called Kirill Veselkov who works at Imperial on the Dream Lab uh, project which is uh, funded by Vodafone and the whole idea has been to look at the potential of um, different cancer-beating molecules within pharmaceutical drugs. I met him over a year ago, and he decided to take that same model and put foods through them and start kind of analyzing exactly what kind of foods have compounds that share uh, similar traits to the compounds that you will find in in, in pharmaceutical drugs. Mm -hmm. And he's found come up with some incredible um, kind of research and findings as a result of this. But one thing that really stood out in this process as we've been kind of going through this is it's one thing to say that cabbage or whatever it may be has all these different cancer beating molecules. But there are so many variables around where it comes from, how it was grown, how it was stored, how you cook it. And that's the big one as well. And then finally, of course, how you metabolize it. And what I tend to find is when you when you read in the news about, as you were saying, you know, meat's good for you, meat's bad for you, eat bacon, don't eat bacon. And I kind of feel that a lot of this is very sensationalized in a sense. And as a result, people are left in a position where they have very little idea as to what the right foods are to be putting into their basket and because people are, there, there's a general globally decline in people's cooking know-how mm-hmm. and ability that a combination of a lack of information and being unsure about what's going in processed foods and what they shouldn't, shouldn't be eating combined with a lack of being able to cook for oneself and cooking from scratch or, you know, uh, more using more whole foods as, as a part of their diet. All of this seems to be leading to a situation where you have children who are growing up in households that as a household they have no idea on nutrition and what are we going to see in the future because all this seems very negative right Mm. but we live in a world where there's plenty like in a way we know that there's over 800 million people who are starving but at the same time we know that there's more food on earth now being produced than ever before. 
what are the positives that we have uh, in store for the future? Well, I mean, the positives are that I think there is now a real recognition that, um, as I said, our food systems and what we eat are really causing massive problems for our health systems. So why is that a positive? It's a positive because many countries in the developing world want to set up universal health coverage. Their, their citizens are demanding it as they get better off. Mm -hmm. It's becoming a political issue for them. But universal health coverage is going to be very, very expensive unless we do something about diets. So I think this, this disconnect we're seeing between food systems and health systems is gradually being closed. And I think that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned uh, schools. Um, because I think one of, one of the most promising things I've seen is, is kids becoming radicalized about this issue. Not enough yet. We're not at the Greta Thunberg level. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if you saw her speech at the yeah. UN General Assembly, the video mm -hmm. of it. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a blog about it last week saying, where's the outrage that people can't get nutritious food easily and affordably? Where's yeah. that outrage? It's not there at the moment. We talk about impossible burgers, but... It's impossible to get nutritious food that's affordable. Where is the outrage? So, um, one of the one of the things I'm um, involved with in a pro bono way mm -hmm. is um, this. Um, it's called Bite Back 2030, okay. which is uh, something that's being put together by a number of different foundations. One of them is, is Jamie Oliver's foundation. Okay, and I like it because it's it's really. Um, it's really got two elements to it. It's sort of above the above the line. It's led by youth. Because there's a youth advisory board, um, the the youth are sort of um, developing the outrage and saying to businesses, governments, um, people like me, what what are you doing about it? How mm -hmm. what are you doing about it? And we want to be part of that. But it also mirrors something we're doing in our work at Gain in Bangladesh, um, which is again treating adolescents as agents of change, not just recipients of programs. So we have this right. thing called the Pocket Money Pledge in Bangladesh. We've gotten a million kids, a million adolescents working through youth groups all over the country. And Bangladesh is 80, 90 million people mm -hmm. working through youth groups all over the country to sign up to a pledge that says we pledge to spend more of our money on healthy snacks. If you, the government, make it easier for us and if you um, kiosks and, and retailers mm -hmm. stock more of this stuff and we're going to we're going to um, set up a, almost like a, um, a validation mechanism, a uh, certification mechanism, which says this is, this is approved by the Pocket Money Pledge. This program or this, this food outlet or this retailer is approved by the Pocket Money Pledge because you commit to improving the, the quality of the food that you sell or produce. And I, think, I do think the outrage level has to, get, I mean, has to be constructive and it has to be channeled yeah. and focused. But I do think it's going to be the younger generation that's 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 generating a lot of it, and uh, the rest of us are going to be supporting that. And we need to do a better job of that in schools. I don't know why schools don't teach more about how to cook food. It's such a fundamental yep. nutrition issue, but a fundamental well, lifestyle what's even worse issue. Is what they serve yes, at school, that's... because if you think about the whole idea of kind of you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, Putting a kid in school, you're there to educate them and kind of mentally nourish them. And then if you look at what kids are being fed, and I'm talking specifically about here in the UK. I mean, you hear in the States, it's much, much worse. But um, I'm taking that as an example of a very progressive uh, city like London in 2019. And you see the food that kids are being served. And even quite honestly, it being let's say a chef and working in this world of kind of sensory uh, design and experiences, and you look at where they serve the food as well and the, the, the whole environment, and you kind of think no one could have a decent meal in this kind of setting and environment, the noise levels, the smells, the so everything. They're all going down that, to the chip shop around the corner, you know. And it, it, it's, it's cheaper, it's, it's out in the open, it's, sorry, it's, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 yeah. go ahead. Well, I just think... Um, just to get wonky again about policy, um, most countries, well, not most, about 80 countries have these things called food-based dietary guidelines. Mm -hmm. The UK has them. But they're all targeted to consumers. 
governments themselves don't abide by these food-based dietary guidelines. So school meals is a good example. Yeah. You know, you should eat this. Well, actually, you should serve this. Um, yeah. Your trade policy should help this happen. Your uh, climate policy, your uh, agricultural policy. Um, so that's another thing. We, we blame businesses a lot, and rightly so. Mm-hmm. But governments are, have, a, have a big role to play, and in many cases, they are absent actually, from this debate. They, they're they very nervous about getting involved in this debate because, it's, uh, as you know, it's, they would be accused of being a nanny state, getting getting yeah. involved in things that are individual personal responsibility. That's what they would say. And I, I think that's, yes, they don't, they don't tell co- um, consumers what to eat, but they need to make it easy to buy healthier food. At the moment, they're not. It's expensive. The high street where I grew up in, in sort of Wanstead, uh, Leightonstone area, mm-hmm. Still, it's just a lot of junk food all over the place. Certainly yeah. when I was growing up, there was a lot of junk food growing up in kebab shops and fish and chip shops and candy um, sweet shops. Yeah. It, it, if you don't make it easy for people to, it, you know, the healthier food has to be there, it has to be affordable, and it has to look good and taste good. And governments can play a role. They can incentivize um, companies, retailers. They can set up low tax, low utility bill areas to encourage businesses to do this. Well, I was get, that was going to be my next question is what can they do? What are the things on the ground that they can do? Because it does seem, I find it like you can't put all the onus on private businesses in a way. They have to find a way as well of maybe kind of what you just mentioned there, incentivizing them mm-hmm. to um, offer and make improve the accessibility of healthier mm-hmm. foods. But how do they actually do that? What would be the kind of practical steps? We're trying to work with uh, a number of governments in Africa and Asia. Um, a lot of these, um, a lot of, a lot of cities now are setting up. A lot of governments are setting up big industrial parks around yeah. around cities, and they're attra- they're trying to attract businesses to these big industrial parks um, in many re- in many in many ways to generate export revenue, so to yeah. produce things for export. Governments need ex- need foreign exchange to, to import stuff they can't produce themselves. What we're trying to and, and to do that, they will get, they will offer companies lower rates, lower tax rates, lower um, utility rates, a whole range of incentives to mm-hmm. get them. They're not big incentives, but they're just enough mm-hmm. to tip them into doing this. Um, we're trying to say to them, you know, you can do the same thing for companies and retailers that are producing nutritious food. In fact. You can entice uh, retailers and producers to those big industrial parks that, in, that employ 100,000 people uh, to, to sell their stuff there. So there's lots of things they can do. They can do sin taxes, which is tax the amount of sugar okay. in soft drinks. Mm-hmm. The UK has that. But do they you can support also, that? The, the... I, we do, yeah. Okay. But you can also do virtue subsidies, you know, the opposite. You can subsidize the consumption of fruits and vegetables and things yeah. that are good. The problem with sugar taxes is not a problem with sugar taxes. I was reading a study the other day. It said it's actually been very successful in the UK. It's the the sugar concentrations have in soft drinks have reduced by twenty or thirty percent, but the overall consumption of sugar has continued to keep rising in the UK from all sources, all mm. types of foods. And that just illustrates one of the big problems that we have is that. It's not just one thing. There's no silver bullet here. It's 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 ten or twenty things that have to happen at the same time. There has to be um, really good government campaigns around healthy eating. You've seen those ones about uh, that compare obesity. No, they compare. Um, yeah, I think they compare obesity to smoking. Yeah. Oh, they got so damned for that, didn't they? I I think they're really effective. I think yeah. they. Um, I'd, I don't know why they got damned, but I think they they make people pay attention. No, it's, I agree. It's, it's, I, it's obesity shaming. Yeah, that, that's. Maybe I think that that's was the issue where the issue was. But so, I think if you if you want to get people's attention, yeah, and I think that was a great way of getting people's mm-hmm. attention because I think now, if you, we know, um, I think it was a couple of years ago that it was a Lancet report that said you know, poor diet. Mm-hmm and nutrition have now surpassed smoking as being the number one cause of illness in Osman. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. I don't know where it is. Um, I hope you noticed that very cool echo on the bunny man. <laughs> <laughs> cool man. Um, so it, it, is, it is a, I mean, the way they did that perhaps was not 
are great because um, people can be obese for all sorts of reasons. Actually, it's not just of what course. You eat. Yeah. So, but the the idea of, of shock and and uh, and just just getting through that we we're, we're all bombarded by so many messages every yeah. day. How do you how do you get through? And it got through to me. I really noticed that that mm-hmm. ad. Um, so you need to create the demand, the positives and the negatives. You need to create the environment that encourages companies to do good things and less bad things. Mm-hmm. And and you and the government needs to step up and, and say, you know, schools, food in schools, food in hospitals, food in in the prison service. It has to be decent food. Yeah. You know, it, so there's 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 ten or twenty different things governments can do. And I'm working with a, a bunch of uh, colleagues to set up a kind of a no regrets set of actions that governments should do to in, in each country because okay. policymakers they're bombarded they, they they're they're told there's a hundred different things they can do to mm-hmm. make their food supply healthier and more affordable mm-hmm. and there are a hundred different things you can do so where do you start do you start at the production side do you start at the, con- the consumer side do you start in the processing where, where do you start do you start with big companies small companies so we're setting up. Uh, we're trying to come up with a list of ten to twelve things. They call we call them no regrets actions. It may not be the number one thing you should do in your country, but mm-hmm. it's it's going to be effective. It's you won't have any regrets if you if you do it. So we need to simplify things for consumers and simplify things for governments. That doesn't mean be simplistic. The science mm-hmm. still really matters. The science has to be translated into these simplified messages. But the messages have to be simple and they have to be unified. So you're you're quite right. It's it's a really complex space, and I don't like to end or talk about how it's so difficult mm. because there are some very basic things we can do. And as we we talked about them, governments yeah. need to procure food healthily. Um, they need to have really compelling campaigns to eat healthily. They they need to ban certain kinds of marketing at certain times of hours and certain media to certain age groups. They need to incentivize companies to reformulate their products. There are all sorts of things they can do. Uh, taxes, fiscal policy, subsidies, tariffs. There's, there's tons of things they can do. The question is, what is turning up the heat on governments to do that? Is it going to be the consumers? Is it going to be the youth activists? Is it going to be the investors? Is it going to be the media? Who, who's going to do that at the moment? There's not enough heat on governments to act. There's a lot of heat on them to, to take to to be aware of plastics, mm-hmm. to be aware of climate change. But governments are busy; they're hectored by lots of people like me. When is this? When is this issue going to raise? But rise surely governments surface? are looking at this, especially governments like in the UK, because of the amount of cost that's going into the national health service. And surely that must be a huge. That would light the fire under you when you look at the NHS bills, wouldn't it? You know, it is, but the, the kind of cycles we're talking about, the benefit-cost ratios, the benefits only materialize over a sort of five to ten-year period. Politicians really only yeah. care about the next two or three years. So it's it's a bit of a disconnect. We, we face that not just in the UK, in all countries mm. we work in. And so if you had one particular element that you feel, or one particular facet or area of your work um, that you see we need immediate attention to that you feel that is, um, you know, really needs both government consumers and all the other stakeholders that you mentioned to be looking at, what would it be? Where would we start? There's one kind of burning issue, Mm -hmm. one thing that's low hanging fruit that we really need to tackle. What would it be? Well, ironically, I think fruit is the low hanging fruit, (laughs) fruit and vegetables. um, They're just way too expensive in every country. And so we could be doing, a whole lot around fruits and vegetables. We could be doing um, stuff around most of the agricultural research and development, the public mm-hmm. sector, government-led ag R&D, is all about raising productivity of cereals. It's very little goes into raising the productivity of fruits and vegetables. And why is that? Uh, it's, it's just, partly it's just kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Path dependency. It, okay. it was very important 40 years ago, and now there's very strong vested interests. Okay. 40 years ago, there weren't enough cereals being produced. Mm-hmm. Now there are. Now we need to switch that. And, but everything's solidified and ossified. And, you know, sure. so it's very difficult to change that. That's the first thing. Second thing we need to do is uh, really incentivize low-cost refrigeration. 
that they're, we need to right. be able to buy refrigerators. People need to buy be able to buy refrigerators that cost five dollars. I believe the technology is is out there and it's not too far away for that that kind of low cost so, well, refrigeration. Give me an idea on why would that be? Why is that? Well, because solar really power solar power is is really becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Okay. The countries again where we work where the the issues is really affordability. I have loads and loads of sunlight. Um, it's an issue because so much food is is lost. Um, right. We talk about food waste in the UK, which is mostly at the consumer and restaurant end. Yeah. But in countries that are lower income, have less well-developed storage and transportation systems, it's mostly about food lost. So we work right. in Nigeria with tomatoes. 50% of Nigerian tomatoes will be lost between product, between harvesting and getting them to the consumers. Because they are transported in grass baskets, which don't, which allow pests to get in, which don't protect them from bruising, there's all sorts of things. So, so the technology for storage and distribution for fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. campaigns around fruits and vegetables, consumer campaigns around fruits and vegetables. Why do we need to eat this stuff? Why is it important? How can you get it more in in in, um, in, in schools and, and hospitals and clinics? Um, and then retailers, what can we do to incentivize retailers to um, put fruits and vegetables, uh, make them in, in the architecture of supermarkets and retailers? How can we make them more prominent, more, more attractive? How can we incentivize retailers to do um, two, uh, three for two price offers on mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables as opposed to the junk that's at the checkout? So I think, I think the way to do it is to, is to pick, a, pick a food group, fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables, unambiguously good for you pretty much i mean not every vegetable and every fruit is the same mm -hmm. but as a group unambiguously good for all the things we care about all the different types of malnutrition we talked about mm -hmm. at the beginning and then have a plan right from from production right through to consumption uh and including food loss and food waste to to really do something about it unless you have a a whole system plan to do something about a particular food it's like those, uh, the Americans call them those whack-a-mole games. You know, you push something down here and it goes up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You have to have something that goes from, from farm to fork. Actually, from before the farm, through seed, seed, you have to produce seeds that are really good quality seeds right. for fruits and vegetables. And then th that's the way to do it. Um, it's not easy, but it's not impossible. Norway uh, just released a, it's the first of its kind, a, a food system action plan. It's highly pragmatic, but highly um, coherent. It goes all the way from ag R and D all the way through to consumer demand campaigns. I'm I'm working with uh, the countries that we work in, the nine countries that we work in in mm -hmm. Africa and Asia, to to help them develop similar action plans. So I could I feel like I could continue a conversation with you with you for hours and hours, but I know I'm going to have to let you go soon. But I do have one final question, which is. Over the time that you've been working in uh, this field, what would you say are some of the kind of goals that have been achieved, some of the things that we have seen overcome, some of the it, progress that we have made? It's been a lot of progress. Um, when I was um, learning about malnutrition, we used, to, we used to see rates of stunting. These are kids who too short for their age mm -hmm. we don't we don't care per se about how how tall they are but if they're short for their age it means their brains aren't developed properly their immune systems aren't developed properly so it's a marker and the rates for stunting uh we're in the 50 percent range for most african countries now many african countries are in their 20 percent range and some are even below it ghana is 19 percent kids are stunted so that's 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 over a 20 25 year period we're seeing that and that's that's great that's two percentage points per year mm -hmm. so i'm very enthusiastic about that and very optimistic about stunting reduction mm -hmm. there are some other forms of malnutrition that are difficult to shift anemia in women is difficult to shift i don't quite know why that is it's because anemia is not just driven by diet it's driven by other things mm -hmm. malaria um, some worm infestations. Partly, I think it's because women are mostly affected by anemia and women have less political power than men. I think if anemia affected men more than women, we'd have a, we'd be seeing much greater progress in anemia. The one that really worries me is obesity and overweight because that's pretty much increasing everywhere. It's sort of maxed out in some parts of the US and the UK, 
Mm-hmm. But you know, at sixty, as two thirds of the population is overweight or obese, a third of the population is obese. That's huge. And the expectations as well of uh, onset of cancer within the yes. population. I mean, mm. it seems that yeah. we're heading towards a situation where at least. Fifty percent of people in any room are at some point likely to be diagnosed with uh, some form of cancer. I think we're going to see life expectancy going down again. Now, that will be a big wake-up call as well for politicians and, and ordinary people. Um, but in the in you know the countries I work in, most of the time are places like Ethiopia and um, you know Mozambique and mm-hmm. and uh, India and ba- Bangladesh. And I I talk to ministers of health quite a lot, and all they want to talk to me about is diabetes. Really? And overweight and obesity because it's it's affecting people they know. You know, they ministers and CEOs don't really know many kids who are malnourished. They mm-hmm. don't really know kids who are stunted and wasted, but they know people who would have diabetes type 2 and overweight. So this gives me hope that um, new alliances will be formed between yeah. those people who care about overnutrition and undernutrition, both, both types of malnutrition. Um, new alliances between people who care about climate and what we eat, because what we what we eat is so effe- is so related to the carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. Mm-hmm. Um, animal source foods tend to generate more CO two and greenhouse gas mm-hmm. emissions. So there are all these new alliances that I'm quite optimistic about uh, will will begin to, as I said, generate the outrage and channel the outrage mm-hmm. and, and the awareness. And I'm also optimistic about uh, youth and adolescents. They're 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 more and more engaged, more and more, you know, they realize that there's a big intergenerational inequity mm-hmm. here. People like me are making decisions at my age that are, are going to affect me for another 20 years, maybe, but they're going to affect them for another 60 or 70 years. Mm-hmm. So there, I think climate awareness is changing the way we think about a whole range of things. And I think I'm very optimistic about changing food systems to generate healthier diets and make them affordable for everyone. That sounds good. Thank you ever so much for taking the time uh, to come here. I know you've got to run, but it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. My pleasure. And thank you for doing what you're doing, because this way, this way, communica- communicating in a nuanced way, getting the messages out, um, showing the complexity, but not generating despair over the complexity, embracing mm-hmm. that and saying there are solutions. The complexity gives you new, uh, new alliances that you never thought about for action. Uh, thank you for doing that because it's it's really really important. Ah, oh, I'm honoured. Thank you. <laughs>